So the next segment is going to be about uh, the different parts of speech that exist in language. So uh, let's look at the first example here. We have a sentence like, Nathalie likes black cats. We can replace the word black with Persian, tabby, or small, and still have sentences that make sense. Nathalie likes tabby cats, or Nathalie likes Persian cats. Well, it's a single word, and they can be used in the same position. Uh, those are usually referred to as the same syntactic category. In this case, the syntactic category, the part of speech is, because it's a single word, is an adjective. Uh, there are many other syntactic categories in, in English and other languages. So those include open and closed categories. Open categories include the categories that can have new words added to them over time. So for example, a no-fly zone is a noun, and twerk is a verb, and those words were added to the vocabulary of English in the relative recent past. We also have closed functional categories such as the, and in, which are respectively uh, determiners or articles and prepositions. Let's look at an example sentence. The dog chased the yellow bird. We have uh, multiple parts of speech here, article, noun, verb, article, adjective, and noun. So in English, there are about eight general types of parts of speech. Uh, we looked at some of them already, nouns and verbs and adjectives. So what do those have in common? So the nouns include things like dog, tree, computer, and idea. They can be either concrete, like the first three, or abstract. They can vary in number, singular and plural, in gender, and in case, not in English, but in other languages. For example, in Latin, the same word, puer, which means boy, can be spelled in many different ways. In the singular, one boy can be puer, in, which is the so-called nominative case or subject case, puerum, which is the accusative or object, and pueri, which is the genitive of the boy. In the plural, we can have pueri, which is the nominative, again, subject form. We can have pueros, which is the accusative, and finally, puerorum, which is the genitive of the boys. Now, the gender doesn't need to match the actual sex of the object being described. So, a typical example that people give is the word uh, in German, Mädchen. The word Mädchen means uh, girl. And uh, because it's a diminutive, the Shen uh, part indicates that it's a small uh, person. The word is uh, neuter in gender, in German, even though it refers to a female person. Now let's look at one of the most famous examples in uh, courses of this nature. It's a short poem uh, extracted from Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, and more specifically the second part of the book. You may have seen this before, but if you haven't seen it, you will realize that this is uh, in gibberish. Uh, most of the words are not valid English words. And yet it is possible uh, for a speaker of English to understand at least the parts of speech of those words even though in some cases this can be tricky. So let's try to do this together. I'm going to give you a minute now to figure out the parts of speech of the words in boldface. So let's uh, look at the answer to the previous question. What are the parts of speech of the words in boldface? The first word is wave and borogos. So those are most likely nouns. And how do we know this? Well, they both follow the word the. In English, typically after the word the, you have a noun. Next one is a little trickier, brillic. What kind of part of speech is this? Well, probably your first guess is that this is an adjective. But it could also be a noun. Let's look at the examples. It could be something like an adjective, like it was early, or it can be a noun, as in it was noon. So, in either case, uh, we don't know exactly the part of speech, but we know it's one of those two. What about mimsy? Well, mimsy is most likely an adjective because of the way it appears in the sentence. Now, what about the slithy toves? Well, this is either an adjective and noun combination, the same as uh, small uh, people, or it can also be a noun and verb combination, similar to the bell toves. Finally, we have the expression mom, rats, out, grape. So this could be a combination of adjective, noun, and verb. But it can also be a combination of noun, verb, and adverb, as in birds fly outside. So the point here is that in some cases, 
You can guess the part of speech of an unknown word based on the context, but in other cases, uh, this can be still very tricky. And the reason why this is an important example is that it mimics what computers do with human language. They see text that they really don't understand. They see a sequence of words, and if they don't have enough prior knowledge about that language or about the uh, words themselves, they wouldn't be able to understand anything. So in that case, what they do is they either use prior knowledge or they reason probabilistically. So there may be a rule in the system that says after uh, the, the next word is a noun with a probability of 99%. And after an adjective, the next word is a noun with a probability of 80% and so on. And then when you combine all the probabilities of the sentences that you observe, you can come up with the best estimate that is consistent with the uh, rules that you know and the text that you have seen. It is also important to use context. So if, for example, you have a word that is ambiguous, uh, maybe in the context you can see other related words that help you disambiguate it. So for example, if you use the word bar in a sentence and the whole text talks about legal uh, issues and uh, uh, lawyers and uh, people finishing law school, it's more likely that this uh, use of the word bar is in the legal sense rather than the uh, establishment, restaurant type of sense. And also computers can be wrong. So they can make a mistake and uh, this can propagate in the whole system. For example, they can ignore a negation and then assume that the opposite of what was said is actually true. The next category of parts of speech is pronouns. In English, they include things like she, ourselves, and mine. Pronouns vary in person, uh, first, second, and third, uh, gender, masculine and feminine, number, and case. English actually has cases from pronouns, and that includes nominative, accusative, possessive, and second possessive. So, uh, more specifically, that could be I, me, my, and mine. And pronouns can also have reflexive and anaphoric forms. So, for example, if I say Samantha gave her a haircut, her must refer to a different person. Whereas if I say Samantha gave herself a haircut, then she gave the haircut to Samantha. So this is a reflexive pronoun. The other categories of parts of speech in English include determiners and adjectives. Determiners are things like articles and demonstratives, things like the, this, that. And adjectives include uh, words that describe properties. Uh, they can be used either attributively or predicatively. So small house is attributive and the house is small. Uh, in that second example, small is used uh, predicatively. Adjectives agree in gender and number in uh, different languages. And they can have a positive form such as short and also comparative and superlative forms such as shorter and shortest. And those comparative and superlative forms can be either derivative or periphrastic. Derivative is when uh, you have a form like small, smaller, smallest, or uh, periphrastic is uh, difficult, more difficult, most difficult. The next category of parts of speech is verbs. That are, includes words that describe actions such as throw, activities such as walk, and states such as have. There are four verb forms in English. Other languages can have many more than that. The tenses are present, past, and future, and different variants of those. Other inflection that exists in English includes number and person. And verbs can also include gerunds, such as ing forms, and infinitives. That's the form of the verb that follows the word to. Verbs can also be uh, distinguished by their aspect. They can be either progressive or perfective, depending on whether the action is still continuing or not. And finally, they can be distinguished based on their voice. So in the sentence, I uh, uh, bought a house, uh, the verb bought is in the active voice, whereas in a ho house was bought, the word bought is in the passive tense, a uh, passive uh, uh, voice, sorry. So some other things about verbs is that they can include things like participles, ed forms, for example, and auxiliaries, words like may and will and shall. Verbs can have different arguments. 
those are the words that come after the verb and indicate uh, some modifications to the verb. For example, the dog sleeps is an instance of an intransitive verb. There is no direct object, that's what intransitive means. The dog chased the cat. In that example, the word chased is a transitive verb because it has a direct object. And finally, in the sentence, Mary gave the, do the dog a bone, we have an example of a ditransitive verb. That's a verb that takes two objects. Gave somebody something. And you can also have things like irregular verbs, so slept and caught. Now, uh, what I said so far applies mostly to English. Uh, other languages have much richer inflections. Uh, the examples that you may be familiar with include languages like French and Latin, which have more than a hundred different forms of a certain verb, and languages like Finnish, which have many different forms, sometimes more than 20 of the same noun. So here's an example of a much more sophisticated uh, inflectional paradigm for verbs. Uh, this, this is an example from French. On this slide alone, there are 36 different forms of the verb to go. And I can promise you that there are at least two more slides that I can show you which have even more forms of the verb, depending on whether it's in present and past and continuous form, or whether it's in a different mood, such as conditional and subjunctive. And now, just to conclude uh, the list of parts of speech, uh, the other parts of speech in English include adverbs, things like uh, happily, which describes a manner, here, which describes a location, and never, which describes a time. Prepositions, particles. So particles can sometimes be confused with prepositions, but uh, there's a very important test that can tell them apart. Particles are usually used in uh, the form of the so-called phrasal verbs. So a phrasal verb could be something like take off. Take off is not uh, some special way of taking. It's a completely different verb or I wanted to take up this matter with the principal. So again, take up is a phrasal verb, and in the two cases that I just showed you, off with two Fs and up are particles that are part of those phrasal verbs. And there's the test that I mentioned, can be used to distinguish between prepositions and particles. Uh, a common example that people use is, she ran up a bill versus she ran up a hill. In the first example, she ran up a bill, ran up is a phrasal verb, whereas in the second example, she ran up a hill, up a hill is a prepositional phrase, and up is not associated with ran. And the way to tell the two apart is very simple. Can we move up and the rest of the sentence to the beginning? So we can say, she ran up a hill, up a hill she ran. So that sounds like a valid uh, paraphrase. Therefore, we have an instance of a preposition. But we cannot do the same thing with she ran up a bill. We cannot say up a bill, she ran, which means that in this example, run and up are parts of the same word, parts of the same verb, rather, and cannot be split up. In that case, up is a particle. The other, the other parts of speech that we haven't talked about include coordinating conjunctions, such as and, or, and but, which are used to connect uh, similar parts of the sentence, for example, apples and oranges. Subordinating conjunctions, which are used to connect different portions of the sentence that are not equal. For example, I can have an entire sentence be inserted by preceding it with the word that. So I can say, I will not go home uh, unless you uh, give me money. So in that example, unless introduces an entire relative clause, you give me money, but I cannot switch the order of the two parts of the sentence and obtain the same meaning. And finally, we have interjections. Those are things like sounds like meow or ouch. And to conclude this section, I would like to show you the uh, labels that I used in uh, part of speech tagging in uh, natural language processing. So part of speech tagging is the process of automatically assigning parts of speech to words. And most of the existing part of speech taggers and natural language parsers use uh, this convention. So NN is a shorthand for a singular noun. NP is a shorthand for proper noun. NNS is uh, for plural noun and so on. The first letter in each code tells you the part of speech. So whether it's N or J or N or C or R or V. 
And the second and third letters, if any, uh, tell you something a little bit more detailed about that word. For example, VB is an uninflected verb. VBN is the EN or a passive perfective form of the verb, such as taken or looked, as used as a past participle. And VBD stands for a verb used in its past tense, such as took or looked, as uh, I looked out, versus uh, the previous sentence where looked was used in a passive voice. So this concludes the section on part of speech tagging, and the next section is going to be on uh, morphology and the lexicon.